I can do whatever I want? Almost. Almost? I mean, it's it's great that we normally clap for these, but, I mean, it's not like we're audio only or anything. This is Control Structure, episode 128, for May 16th, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs128 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. 128 is 2 to the 7th power. It's 2 to the... Uh, yeah. It's a good number. Yes. It's a it, really good number. And at least back in the day, it was the most common bitrate for MP3s. Mm, I do remember the, those times. Yeah, like whenever you would like play an MP3, and if you had a decent player, it would show you the bitrate of the MP3, and you would know that the bigger the number, the higher the quality, but it would make the download like so much longer. <laughs> it just takes so long to dial up, doesn't it? Yeah. I downloaded LibreOffice, no, well, back then it was OpenOffice, on uh, dial-up once. It took oh. me about a month, and I used <laughs> WGET and just kind of like downloaded a bit, then shut the phone off so that people could make phone calls and <laughs> things like that. And I turned the phone back on and downloaded some more. It was fun times. Um, by the time that uh, OpenOffice had come out, uh, I had uh, a USB thumb drive and some poor sucker that I could use as internet connection for a few minutes. <laughs> Please you go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we uh, did a video podcast. We did do a video podcast, and we even got feedback. Yes, which is awesome. Uh, so if you haven't seen what we're talking about, um, please stop and go watch it. <laughs> because it is amazing, and it took me about a week and a half to edit. Um, the last four minutes took about four days. <laughs> um, the first three days uh, consisted of actually getting the computer, you know, operational. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, we, we, uh, I built a computer and Steven just kind of stood around. Basically, yes. <laughs> not, not to demean you or anything, but, uh, you know, uh, so... Uh, for a few days, you know, I was, you know, getting everything, you know, every, like how it should be, you know, getting my files back on, installing Firefox and all that, all this other stuff, and figuring out why it crash, why it likes to crash when things get, you know, kind of busy. So, I'm like, okay, well, usually the first thing for unexplained crashes is that the memory is bad. So, I uh, got the uh, Mem Test 86 program and let it run for like an hour or so, and it checked out. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be a little hard. So uh, I think I even downloaded uh, was it Super Pi or something that like really stresses your CPU oh, the one out. That calculates Pi. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that you know does it over all your cores, and you know it kind of. The CPU temperatures, because this is what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to, like, stress out your CPU so it gets really hot. Mm -hmm. And for me, really hot is, like, 76 degrees Celsius, which is completely acceptable. And so, you know, it was, like, running completely stable. And so uh, then I realized that, you know, it might have something to do with the sound. Uh so the sound uh, is a little bit complicated because I have a surround sound receiver that is connected through HDMI that runs out the back of my video card. So, like, the video card might have also had some uh, problems to deal with this as well. So it was uh, pretty uh, kind of old school about how it crashed in that... Like, the sound would kind of get staticky, then completely cut out. And then over the next 
10 or 15 seconds, you could visibly feel the computer grinding to a halt. Just slower and slower. Until the pointer wouldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> I love the days back when your computer stopped working and like the last thing it played, it just like plays it back again and again like, and like, again. Like the last 50 milliseconds of yeah, whatever. The last dying thought it had before it died <laughs> and brought up the wonderful blue screen. It just like kind of plays it back. Yeah, just as an eternal remembrance of whatever important work you the, were doing. The last thought it had before it died. You know, uh, whether that important work being your uh, senior uh, English paper or uh, running down guys with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's see, I think I did three things. Uh, one of them involved reinstalling the drivers. So I uninstalled the NVIDIA drivers that I had on there and like rebooted into safe mode or something. Um, but eventually, even though I did not like, uh, how should I say, obviously installed the NVIDIA drivers, like I stayed away from the install program. It's Windows still had some drivers back somewhere that I kept on installing. When does it does that? So even though I had deleted the uh, program files NVIDIA folder, it still managed to come back. <laughs> along with all the NV whatever DLLs in the uh -huh. system directory, which I went through and deleted twice, and they still kept coming back. So... Uh, at some point, I you know managed to get it as clean of a driver install that I could. Uh, then I put the video card into the second PCIe 16 slot, the one like sort of in the middle of the slots in the bottom. Um, and I think I did something else. Uh, but whatever I did, it worked. So you just changed the order of the slots and messed around with it, and it just suddenly started working. Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I guess at some point it decided, okay, he's a little angry, he's messing around with my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it be, I'll be good. <laughs> so um, then after that, I needed to learn how to edit video <laughs> because... I've never edited video before. So, so what software did you end up using? Uh, more on that later. Okay. Uh, so uh, then after that, I had to use said knowledge to edit said video of me building said computer on said computer. A lot depended upon you getting it to work. A lot depended on me building it and getting it running correctly. <laughs> so, yeah... I'm not sure if that's just meta or inception level or if there's just too many moving parts to it. But uh, after about 10 days, uh, a video podcast was posted. So, um, and I was kind of mentally exhausted because I kind of got tired of doing the same thing every night for about two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a bit of time. Um, if anything else, please watch about the last five minutes. It is amazing. So, uh, yeah, hope you enjoy that. And yes, we did an okay Google bomb on that. You should have uh, warned them before you, before you did that, Andrew. Um, well, I just kind of want to be a little annoying, not completely annoying, like not like jerk annoying, you... just, just a little annoying, you know, like, you know, maybe like a little you know, prank here and there or something that, you know, doesn't really mean anything. Uh, like an OK Google bomb. <laughs> uh, but what we didn't do was what Burger King did a while ago in making Google Home devices uh, post, uh, at least I thought it posted an endorsement of, uh, you know, like the Whopper on Google+, Plus, but apparently it just, like, brought up the Wikipedia page and, like, the endorsement was only, a, like, a uh, speculation. And the best part was it reads the first line on that page that comes up. And so uh, the editors of the article, they went ahead and changed it. This is a warning about how this is going to start an editing war and this is a serious security risk or something like that. And uh, they said, you know, 
after it was a couple hours or a few minutes, when they noticed that when they played the commercial and it bombed the, their Google TV thing, that, that suddenly their warning came up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they locked down the article and, of course, and uh, Google fixed <laughs> the voice for that particular voice. So it doesn't do it anymore. But it does open up a, a, a question that has been there for a while of, uh, is this really a good thing? Yeah, and I'm not sure what it is, but there's something in your mustache. There's something in my mustache. Is it? Is yeah, it you got it. Yeah, okay. you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but not that Google Plus even matters that much, since this podcast network contains the only Google Plus users in existence. Hey, I am on Google Plus. I never use it, but I am there. <laughs> I am also technically on Google Plus, and the only thing that I've used it for is to post pictures of... Uh, of Chris and Elsa. Do the war! Maybe she'll finally secede the crown to the true king of Arendelle. You didn't read outside. Okay. What does it say? Okay. A birthday wish. Wish. For magical moments, sweet surprises, and fun adventures. Aww. That's what happy birthdays are made of. Aww. Hope yours is the happiest of all. Heart from Stephen and Andrew. Raspberry? 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 You don't have neighbors, do you? Still no. Raspberry! <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you asked that, I knew what you were going to do. Obviously. <laughs> Speaking of OK Google stuff, uh, you can put a Google Assistant on your Raspberry Pi. Apparently, you can uh, buy a kit that's not in stock in places. That comes with a speaker and USB microphone and a fancy button you can push. Uh, but the author of this article, after being frustrated with not having that kit, just went out and bought the parts. And he wired himself up a button on a breadboard and installed the uh, image. And apparently there's ways you can customize it. He was saying that he can make an LED light turn on and off by voice. Which just looking at that, that's that's a good thing because that gives you layers of abstraction. If you can tie in with the Google and have a code up there and then have your software device there. That, it opens up a lot with the cloud. I was like seeing my garage door open right now. I can think, okay, garage door, open up or something. Of course, you probably want to not so let it be an outside speaker. What exactly is the button used for? Uh, it makes it listen. Oh. So this could make it bomb-proof, I suppose. <laughs> I guess, yeah. So, um, I actually saw this one today, but you can go ahead and explain this. Okay. So, uh... Raspberry Pis are great for this small, low power, just do a simple task uh, or playing with as a kid's toy. But when it comes to servers, they have some serious limitations if you want to serve up files. Uh, your USB isn't the fastest way to connect to a hard drive. And also, too, the RAM is kind of limited on them as well. And so uh, this guy was saying that he thought if you bought a Dell Optiplex FX160, uh, which you can apparently pick up on eBay for about $45, he says, uh, that it's just a little microcomputer that they use often for Citrix cases where you just want like a uh, client... What's like a term? terminal or something. A terminal, yes, that's a good term for it. More of a terminal situation. Uh, but it does actually let you put in a 2.5-inch hard drive in it and gigabit a ethernet RAM. yes and gigabit ethernet so it's actually a quite nice little machine for 45 dollars and it would uh, from that perspective give you a server that runs ix86 stuff and uh pretty low power so it's it's an interesting idea and also to note that this guy is in australia where tech is kind of expensive so like the 35 dollars that we pay here might be 50 at uh, least over there so not not including all so the parts this could even be cheaper than a Pi for him then possibly possibly yeah especially if he's getting it second hand and uh <laughs> this came a little late for me because the other day i actually funded a kickstarter where supposedly uh they're making this uh 
Linux based server that oh it does support like four drives but uh, that was like 160 some that I I put into that Kickstarter we'll see if that actually comes up to anything though or not well if you can go ahead and look for that and we'll put it in the I, notes I, I can try and find it so uh, while you're doing that uh, Intel CPUs made since 2010 have a serious code escalation vulnerability uh, so uh, Intel CPUs have a number of management features that are useful for, you know, deployment in companies and enterprises and other, like, big corporate things. Um, so, like, not only, like, are the uh, Office Monkey PCs, uh, like, need to be managed, but also servers, too. And Intel has a slew of uh, things to do that. Uh, the... Vulnerabilities here specifically include the Active Management Technology, Standard Manageability, and Small Business Technology, uh, starting with firmware version 6 and up. So this goes back to 2010. Uh, so, uh, yeah, apparently this is claimed to not exist in their consumer-grade firmware, uh, but I'm a little skeptical of that. Uh, because their management engine still exists and ships, which um, is kind of nerve-wracking once you read into it. This is like conspiracy-grade uh, fear-mongering here. Uh, recent Intel x86 processors, and recent being like 2008, I think, uh, implement a secret, powerful control mechanism that runs on a separate chip that no one is allowed to audit or examine. When these are eventually compromised, they'll expose all affected systems to nearly unkillable, undetectable rootkit attacks. The Intel Management Engine is a subsystem composed of a special 32-bit microprocessor that's physically located inside the chipset. It is an extra general purpose computer running a firmware blob that is sold as a management system for big enterprise deployments. So, you know, essentially this is just a computer running inside your computer that can pretty much own everything. Um, so, like, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this. I, I was I was kind of googling and listening on this side, but it it sounded like basically your chip, since it's closed source and inside there, it can kind of do whatever it pleases inside there, and there's really no way to know what it does. Yeah, but um, that doesn't hold a candle to Wanna Cry. This has been the huge ransomware breakout that appeared over last weekend, and I say weekend in quotes because it started on Friday, uh, and it has been going around for, a, and it's going to hang around for a long time through forks and copycats. So uh, the main, uh, how should I say, the main vector to this is that it's, ab that it's able to pretty much take control and encrypt everything on your drive, uh, where the machine supporting the uh, protocol that is the server message block protocol, the uh, default file sharing, um, uh, the default file sharing protocol that's built into Windows since like Windows ninety five. Um, so this file sharing protocol uh, has not received a critical security patch from Microsoft that was issued on March fourteenth and addresses vulnerabilities in SMB version one. Microsoft doesn't mention uh, that SMB version 2, uh, but others have stated that WannaCry targets V2, uh, as has Symantec. Uh, in other words, you've had to be almost two months behind in your patch cycle in order to get hit with this. That's a long time to be behind in patches. Windows 10 machines are not subject to this vulnerability that this patch addressed, and are therefore not at risk of malware propagating through this vector. Likewise, uh, no commentary suggesting that other SMB implementations, such as Samba, are impacted. So, uh, a little bit uh, further background is that, you know, all software has bugs, <laughs> right? This is true. You know, unless you're NASA and you spend, like, years 
you know, debugging something. Well, okay. I heard that there's a certain fighter plan. I don't know which one it is, but there aren't supposed to cross over like the, uh, the you know, where like your date and time ranges, like the time zones. There's like a certain thing. You're not supposed to cross over the line at a certain time or something because it like messes up the plane. They just know about it and it's like, just leave it be. Don't fly there at that time. So this is on an aircraft? Yeah, some older one. I don't know which one it is. Huh. I forget. It's been a while since I read about it. Anyway, sometimes they do keep bugs. It's just like, we know about it. Don't do that. Don't touch it. It's like so, the developer, don't touch that. So this specific vulnerability in question was discovered by the U.S. government and kept secret for offensive purposes. Microsoft is generally on the ball about patching things because... Everyone kind of dreads the doom clock, uh, you know, whenever Windows, you know, comes up and says 15 minutes until restart. Yes, and it's always at the worst time. It's like, I was in the middle of a game! <laughs> uh, so, uh, they're on the ball about patching things, and they did patch this uh, once they knew about this vulnerability, uh, because they patched it two months ago. However... People don't update for a variety of reasons, and this is the only reason that so many noobs got pwned. So, uh, let's see, another uh, bit about this is that, you know, Microsoft has, you know, publicly criticized uh, this practice of governments of, like, uh, you know, hoarding these vulnerabilities and not telling anyone about them because, you know, someone knows about them and they can still be exploited by anyone you know and especially if they get out which the nsa had a leak recently uh from the shadow brokers uh no one exactly knows who they are and for good reason i imagine um and it is uh it's claimed like i haven't actually verified this but i've heard it claimed that the code in this specific attack is, was directly lifted from the code that was leaked from the NSA. <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, along with all of this, you know, you need to, you know, stay updated. You know, auto update is enabled for a reason, and those reasons include stuff exactly like this and it doesn't hurt to reboot occasionally too so it can install the updates <laughs> yes um so another thing is you know if this happens to you and you don't have backups well you are literally hosed you know you are going to be left stranded without your files so um you know because otherwise if you really really wanted them you would have to pay hundreds of dollars in Bitcoin to someone you don't know in hopes that they will give you the key to unencrypt your files. So, um, uh, an interesting feature of this uh, particular uh, malware is that it had a, is that it has a kill switch. Uh, apparently, it would try to access some domain of really long characters.com uh, a randomly uh, typed address that primarily consists of keys in the top rows of the keyboard uh, in other words someone mashed a key to mashed a keyboard to generate this if this computer could communicate with the host name it would exit because that uh, but because the domain wasn't registered for a while uh, you know, it continued to go on until a researcher figured it out and simply registered the domain name. So, uh, yeah, that's a kind of weird kill switch. <laughs> uh, but, you know, due to network conditions, uh, you know, this, this domain might not be accessible to everyone everywhere. Uh, so, you know, this instruction infection may still be spreading. Uh, so, another, and again, don't tell people to turn off Windows Update, and do not tell people how to turn off Windows Update. Just don't. Even though Windows 10 has a very annoying update. It's because of this essential protection provided by automatic updates 
that those advocating for disabling the process are being labeled the IT equivalents of anti-vaxxers. And while uh, this blogger doesn't fully agree with the real-world analogies like this, you can certainly see where they're coming from. Uh, as with vaccinations, patches protect the host from nasty things that the vast majority of people simply don't understand. So, um, that's, uh, thank you for, uh, Troy Hunt for this, uh, sort of succinct, uh, you know, representation, uh, of everything. Um, another thing is that, you remember Windows XP? I, I do remember Windows XP. And how we said goodbye to it? I do remember saying goodbye to XP. Never more an update. That's what Microsoft said. Well, apparently they went back on this, this one special case. Um, so, uh, apparently lots of people still run Windows XP. They, so They would spend the time and money to do that. It implies that. Yeah, just for like ecosystem concerns, I guess. So, because, you know, even though, you know, Windows XP is not supported and no one should be running it, people do. <laughs> and when a uh, unpatched Windows XP system in a internal network somewhere can infect much newer systems. One interesting thing is I was hearing on the news today uh, that they're saying that people in other countries are more hit by this, mainly because they tend to use pirated <laughs> copies that can't update. Yeah, uh, specifically China. Specifically China. China! China! Yes. So, um, while you're on uh, Troy Hunt's blog, um, you reckon you've seen some bad security things? Well, here, hold my beer. Um, so he uh, sort of dissects some very uh, insecure security mechanisms uh, that uh, even says, you know, your password is not unique. Uh, a website might say this to you, and if it says it to you, it's a very bad thing. Um, including uh, other things like passing back the username and password in cookies. Um, and the, how should I say, the brain-dead corporate responses that pretty much cover it up and say, everything's okay, this is secure! We don't want to spend the money to fix it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no oh, one will pay us to fix it. So remember that one website that got annoyed at Mozilla? I don't know which one it was, but it, I, I have seen it popping up in various places. I have seen Firefox now giving the one like, oh, hey, you're not logging into a secure connection here. Yeah. So um, uh, I believe I mentioned this. Yeah, it was that one update that... Uh, uh, the comment by Oil and Gas International, uh, referenced the other day in the post on my new HTTPS course. This is where things get cranky, because Firefox is warning users when a login form is loaded insecurely. Uh, so, like, whoever this is from this Oil and Gas International, I believe it's like some kind of magazine. Your notice of insecure password and or login automatically appearing on the login for my website is not wanted and put there without our permission. Please remove it immediately. We have our own security system, and it has never been breached in more than 15 years. Your notice is causing concern by our subscribers and is detrimental to our business. Their website uh, kind of stopped working not long after <laughs> that. The SQL injection probably didn't help. They're back now, although it's unclear whether or not they've reset the clock on the whole 15 years thing. I get the feeling that they were putting the challenge out there and someone's like, challenge accepted! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, let's see. Uh, password reset. Is it right that all one needs to change their password is their username and date of birth? Um, so, a uh, whole other things. Uh, security question on a website I was just on. What is the name of your grandmother's dog? <laughs> uh, let's see. You know what's hard? Passwords. If only there was an easier way. Uh, let's see. This is a whole new level. Stupid. The password is the last four digits of your mobile number. What? 
the mobile number is your login. <laughs> oh yeah, that's rather funny. Um, and if you have to explain to users how you use your website, you're websiting wrong. Probably. <laughs> no, you are. Uh, so yeah, like it keeps on going on and on, but yeah, you get the idea. And Microsoft is down. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, hey, you gave away the spoiler. I'm sorry, it came up, and I just, every chance I get to bash Microsoft, I do. So, a new Python IDE was released. It's called Visual Studio. Have you heard of it? Uh, I, I recognize the name. I, I think I saw it in my Linux machine once when I was uh, building some OpenSCAD scripts. Really? Visual Studio? Yes. Nice. I, I love the new community edition. It is, uh, VI is pretty good, but it's the best visual editor if you want to exclude VI for a second in, in Linux. So it's actually not bad. So um, I installed Visual Studio not too long ago, and I guess this is the first time I'm running it, but um, I haven't exactly tried it out, although I want to. So, you know that little tea time project that I had that shows the times of when the tea comes? Yes, your single page app. Yes. Uh, like, while editing the video, I couldn't, like, let go of the itch to improve that a little bit. Uh-huh. So, like, you know, I wanted to get the video done, but I also wanted to, you know, like, write some code and make this, you know, project better of mine. But, um, you know, I, I successfully you know, put the whole, put the brakes on that. So of which at least I'm thankful that I don't have a video to edit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I will definitely be taking this uh, visual studio thing for a spin. So uh, system 76 is an OEM that builds Linux systems as in like now it literally manufactures them and doesn't, like buy other equipment and put their label on them. So, uh, you know, like I haven't like seriously considered buying a pre-built PC, but like whenever discussions of like, why does no company like ship PCs with Linux on them? It's like, well, sure, there's Dell. Like they actually have PCs you can order with, uh, with Ubuntu on them. Uh, but, you know, System76 pretty much specializes in Linux systems. See, the thing is, I feel like most people that are into Linux deep enough probably build their machine themselves most of the time anyways. Which I would tend to agree with that. But it's nice that a company's doing it, so. So uh, some of those computers might have some, some of those fancy AMD Zen CPUs. You know, I've actually heard good things about those. Really? Yeah. Uh, I might try one out sometime. Uh, so if you think that a mass market 8-core CPU is a little extreme, uh, new leaks uh, suggest Ryzen 9 CPUs with 10, 12, 14, and 16-core parts. Uh, which, you know, after the uh, symmetrical multi-threading would double the uh, thread count on those. Uh, so, you know, these are like more uh, like sort of extreme enthusiast and even like server grade CPUs, um, you know, like computers that have multiple CPU sockets on them, mm -hmm. like that kind of level. I, I used to have a motherboard from back in the 90s that had two sockets on it. So like, you know, what kind of processors would go into those? It was like a P3. Oh, a Pentium 3? Well, nice. So, uh, apparently these new AMD CPUs will have a 4,094, quote, pin, unquote, LGA socket, which is what I want from AMD, like, everywhere. You know, like, Intel has LGA sockets everywhere. AMD, please make these things, like, everywhere. Proliferate them, please. Because, like, that model just makes sense. I'd rather replace a $100 motherboard 
than a five hundred dollar CPU. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you know, like even though it might cost less to ship that five hundred dollar CPU, like it actually costs more to replace if it had to come to that. Could be perspective which way sells the more processors. <laughs> So, uh, let's see, then you, uh, had something on here. Ah, Open Snitch. So, uh, I had never heard of it before, but apparently in Mac, you can have a firewall called Little Snitch, which, looking from the screenshots, I'm guessing it's kind of like Zone Alarm, if you're familiar, how it pops up, like, hey, so-and-so is trying to talk to the internet. Can they talk to the internet? And you're like, sure, I guess I let Firefox talk to the internet. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, someone made a port of that called open snitch uh that works in linux so it'll pop up and you can whitelist or block or deny uh things which i thought was kind of neat to have that uh so you could keep keep control over your apps and uh make sure that nothing's going in or out that you don't know about to give you the extra fine control so like the uh, screenshot here says telnet google.com 80 wants to connect to such and such and such uh you know on port 80 <laughs> And, you know, it has a dialog box that comes up there. So Most of the time, stuff in Linux isn't user-friendly, and that seemed like a specifically user-friendly app, which made it nice that someone was building stuff like that for people. Uh, another Linux thing is PPA-Purge. Uh, it is a script that actually downgrades a package to the official Ubuntu version and then disables that PPA. So, like, in my case, I have a custom Cura PPA installed, and it doesn't always work. Sometimes it has, like, these weird things when you get the weekly build or nightly build. It just isn't always stable. And so that seemed like a, a handy thing in the future. If I hit that situation, I can always go back to Ubuntu's one without too much pain. It's, it seems like a rather easy command. You can run in it or just pop you back to the old version. Seems to be uh, kind of useful there. So, SQL is old. Like, really, really old. Like, 43 years, in fact. And I, I can scarcely think of, like, anything as useful that is as old as it is. In the technology world. Yeah. Like, this is, like, Grandpa. It is kind of like Grandpa. Well, okay, okay, I step that back. SQL is Grandpa's Grandpa. And probably your kids and grandkids will be using SQL. <laughs> yes. Just because it's so useful. It's, it's, it's a core concept. The interesting thing about SQL is there's been so many different implementations of it, but the core concept has remained the same. So, uh, you know, this, you know, you know, shows some charts here that, you know, SQL is one of the most common uh, computer languages out there, yet it's sort of in the middle when it comes to love. Yeah, it's, it's not... Some people find it fun, but I never... Not my most favorite language. What's interesting about the charts, if it's the second most common language out there, why is it that in college, maybe some colleges are different, why is it in college they give you like one database class and be like, hey, there you go, now you know how to use SQL. And then they give you like four or five like other types of programming classes does that make sense not really but then again my uh my college was very different uh i like to say that half of it was java half of it was c sharp and the other half of it was sql okay so they actually gave you a fairly heavy dose of it though. yeah like you could graduate with like like a specialization in databases I mean, and, I, guess, I guess I'm talking like a normal programming track that's not necessarily database focused because really, and I guess there are companies that have dedicated database people, but really in my experience, well, and, and I didn't even specialize in databases and yet, you know, like you got like a third of databases. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like that's probably like a decent one, balance. One of the three halves was databases. <laughs> One of the three has was databases. Yes. Yeah. It, exactly. It it managed to like weave into the other classes because it was like, hey, we're uh, writing this uh, list here, and yeah, we need to write this uh, SQL script to fetch us off from my fancy database in the other room. 
so some of the reasons that it gives here is that it's math, it, or at least it's related to math. Uh, it's battle-tested. Uh, there's lots of knowledge about it. It's rather simple, at least with a select statement. Once you get off into like stored procedures and triggers, have and fun. Get, yeah, it gets a little rough there, to say the least. Uh, it's ubiquitous in that you know, uh, you know, you will find databases whenever like any kind of mildly data intensive application exists. Um, it's open source and somewhat interoperable uh, between the various databases out there, and it's also very fast. So, like, if you need to do any kind of data transformation, you should probably do it in SQL. Okay, funny story. Once upon a time, I was uh, updating our company. We have a database of drug interactions in that... No, okay, back up. The, the product we use has a database of drug interactions. Right. To use the, that database, uh, you actually have to... Uh, compare your ICD-10 codes with that. So that's like your disease state codes. Right. And so I was analyzing the data, trying to organize it some, and I, I popped it into Excel, like all 40,000 records. Excel just couldn't really deal with that. So I spun up a database really fast and popped my data in there and like wrote some queries. And like I had to answer really, really fast. And I spent like a long time using Excel. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> it was really stupid to use Excel for that long. <laughs> yeah. I got my answers so fast using SQL. Yeah. Um, an alarming amount of heavy data processing occurs in Excel where it kind of shouldn't. Yeah, it's it wasn't a good tool. I, initially, when you just had a few, it was okay. But then it just, when it got, I mean, when you get up to 40,000, it just was not a good tool for the job. move on to ha, uh, appreciate. I was, I was trying to find the next one. Wings Over Pittsburgh. I, w I went to the air show here this past Saturday and uh, got to see a bunch of different cargo cargo planes and F-22 Raptor flying and Sky Typers and uh, Thunderbirds were there as well. And I even had my picture taken. Take a look at the last picture. The very last one? Yes. No, the last one. This one? Yes. I can't see you? Read the caption. Oh, silhouetted. It has my name on it. <laughs> you can't recognize me. That's <laughs> cheating. That's cheating. <laughs> it, it is my photo. <laughs> um, so yes, my five minutes of fame have passed. <laughs> I will now live the rest of my life under a rock. Well, and on podcasts. And on podcasts. Uh, so back when I uh, lived up in Robinson, uh, like my uh, first job was uh, like actually across the road uh, from the airbase up there okay. in uh, like one of those like office uh, towers there. So I forget what exactly I was doing that drawed me into the office on a Saturday, but like I was there, you know, popped in for like what two, three hours or something. And I'm like, Oh, they're, like, having an air show over there. So, like, I walked, like, a mile down to the main road, across the freeway, uh -huh. and up into the air base there. So, uh, that was uh, kind of neat there. I walked around for, like, maybe half an hour or so. Um, so, yeah. Another thing of note is that uh, this is the 911th uh, airlift wing. And... You know, naturally, they did their show on 9-11. Makes sense, then. <laughs> yeah. I heard they were actually thinking of closing it down, but then recently they got extra funding or something, and now they're planning on expanding it and buying new airplanes or putting in new systems and things. So another thing that I, that I thought was kind of interesting is that there's, you know, the air base, and then, like, Literally on the other side of the runway is the airport, like the Pittsburgh airport. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, I mean, it's like right there. 
So during the show is the kind of between flights you see an airliner kind of come in and touch down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like I was actually reading about that, and apparently Pittsburgh International is the third largest airport by area. Interesting. So is that counting the military bases part of the area then, or I'm, just the? I'm the not airport? sure, but at least the third largest. Uh, I guess maybe commercial airport in the United States. Hmm. So just by like sheer like land area yeah. and not by like passengers okay. or cargo or like anything else. It's a big place for sure. Yeah. So, and I would like to appreciate Blender. Uh, that is the, uh, the 3D modeling tool uh, for like uh, film animation and CGI stuff. So, uh, you might be asking, why am I appreciating this, Andrew? Didn't you have a video to edit? And that is, Blender has a video editor into it. So nice. that is what I used to edit the podcast last so week. So did you like it as far as an uh, editing tool? It Once I knew the hotkeys, I was okay with it. Okay. I was curious because while video is kind of its thing, it seems... It's more about 3D, so that's I was kind of curious if it because sometimes you can do do different things in the same tool, but it's not quite made for that, so it doesn't doesn't fit the glove quite right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, here I am opening up the uh, project for the video, and you can see uh, some of the tracks in here. Okay. I I can see like your timeline and stuff. It actually looks a lot because I've used. Uh, the Pinnacle Studio before, and a few different ones, and the Sony one as well, and it looks pretty similar, really, to what yeah. you normally see. So, you know, you can, you know, adjust it around and stuff. Um, and, like, I even followed, I I actually uh, Googled, like, open source video editing, and apparently the actual specialized video editing programs are all on Linux. Uh, really? The one exception was Blender, and I'm like, I've actually heard of that before. Wait, Blender doesn't support Linux? It does. Oh, okay, good. good. But but I also knew that it ran on Windows. Ah, I see. So that was, you know, thus the only exception in that, you know, it runs on Windows. You, so, you were looking for the Windows aspect. Of yeah, support. Because, because, like, I'm just getting settled in here. Like, I don't really want to run a virtual machine at this point just to edit. Virtual machine? You should be running Windows on the virtual machine. That's the one that could encrypt your whole hard drive for <laughs> ransomware. <laughs> Uh, only if you don't uh, patch your stuff. So, uh, also, don't let idiots on your network. That too. That too. So I must um, have passed the idiot test. Yes. <laughs> so you're you're on Linux. That kind of proves you're not an idiot. So uh, one of the things that I needed to get used to was like down here on the editing track that le the left mouse button kind of jumps you around, like uh, you know, like kind of jumps you around from like time to time to yes. time. Whereas the right mouse button like, moves things around and shrinks and expands things. Let's see. Which, like, I would sort of think that might be your primary thing to do. So thus, you would probably want to be on the left mouse button. I feel like you, you would navigate through the video most of the time. Sometimes, but, like, when you have a clear vision of, like, what things, of you, what the things sequentially are. Sequentially going through and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it ended up being okay, um, and because I'm primarily left-handed, uh, but I use my mouse in my right hand, that I'm kind of a hot key whore. Uh huh. So, like, uh, like especially in uh, strategy video games, that you know, like I'm always like hot keying things, like selecting buildings and groups of uh, soldiers and stuff, and you know, like if I want to like make like six dudes or something like I just press the key like really fast. I feel like that's cheating that you're left-handed and you get to use the keyboard with your primary hand for well, these hotkeys. Sometimes, but then that kind of comes out of penalty of like less precision in the other hand. It's true. You, you train it a lot since you do use the right-handed mouse. So you've probably got it trained pretty decent. Yeah. So and like there are a few times that uh like you know my hands are just doing different things. Like, both the hands know what the other one's doing, but they're still doing completely different things, if you get what I'm saying. That you want to interact with what the other hand's doing, but you're still making them do different things? Yes. Okay. 
like two different sides of the whole brain uh-huh. or something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Blender I can actually get behind. That's, so. pre- that's pretty nice. Yeah, I did, you know, I, of course, I have been, you know, as far as, like, the interface in Blender, it's not exactly the best, but then I think that was more uh, with the, uh, uh, like, with the 3D modeling part. So, uh, you know, like, I'll go ahead and post the video that I sort of followed that, you know, the guy says, yeah, this is actually possible and, you know, in some ways better than, like, was it Final Cut Pro or something? So, yeah. Another thing that I want to appreciate is Fraps. And this is what I've used to capture the uh, the video, uh, the actual game video uh, that I used at the end that I slipped behind uh, fancy speed and blur effects. So... Um, unfortunately, this doesn't exactly capture, uh, like, uh, the Windows console, uh, windows. So, oh, like, so if the it's command not prompts. Full sc- oh, you're saying the, the actual legit command line game. Well, no, like, the actual command prompt. Okay. Like, it doesn't do that, but, like, if it, like, is an actual 3D game, it'll do fine. Okay. So, or even, like, 3D Mark. <laughs> Because it's like a 3D context, and it's using the GPU to do things, it'll capture that too. So, so what you're you're telling me is this game has profiled text-based as key video games and not supported them? Mm, not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it pretty much is a program that looks at the frame buffer on your GPU and steals anything that comes up. I see. So, yeah, and it's been around for a very long time. Uh, I initially got it uh, back in 2008 uh, because among all of its other features, uh, you know, it can screenshot things uh, with, like, a simple hotkey, and then it can put it, like, anywhere. Uh, It can also display a frame rate counter in a corner of your screen. So back in 2008, when I got a really nice computer for the first time, I bought this to essentially display a counter in a corner of my screen that just said 60 all the time. Oh, I see. So I, I knew that uh, like I was getting my money's worth by having a super smooth frame rate all the time. So, And uh, also, Fraps can benchmark things. So that's how I got the Witcher 3 and Fallout 4 benchmarks. So on the it video. really becomes a good multi-tool because it can do the screen capture, recording, plus your benchmarking, your frame rate. Yeah. So unfortunately it does require administrative privileges, but you know, you can kill it when you need to. So along with the video, it can capture the sound. So yeah. Very nice. Do you remember Toby back from 2005? Not really. Apparently these guys found this rabbit that was hurt outside. So they decided to take care of it. But it was going to cost some money. So they uh, they started a website called SaveToby.com. And what they said is, if you give us money uh, as a community, $50,000 to pay for the care of this rabbit that's eating us out of house and home... We won't eat it. If, however, we don't, we're going to eat it to recoup our costs. <laughs> and uh, so it created quite the rage and death threats and uh, various scenes. Eventually, they got bought out by a company. Uh, anyways, and they went on to write their own book about, you know, Toby and recipes for cooking rabbits. And how do you create a website to scam people for money to And how, yeah. Anyways, so they wrote a book about how to do what was in the book. Very, very interesting thing. Anyway, so the rabbit. Uh, uh, so Toby has a new fear now because I got a new gun. I got a uh, Frontier Flintlock made by Peter Sill. It's a thirty six caliber, perfect for shooting rabbits sitting in the yard or wherever after rabbit season starts. Strange that you mention this. For the past week, I have seen a rabbit in my backyard. It's not rabbit season till like October 20-something, so it's going to be a while. And... And one of the days that I uh, drove my car to work, coming back, I saw like two or three rabbits just on the street. There's been a lot of them. Uh, living, I, living rabbits. Living rabbits, yes. 
See, this is the time of the year when there's always a lot out and about, like in the yard and in yeah. the garden and stuff like that. And then partway through the summer, they just kind of disappear. I think they get eaten. Like, they're, they're pretty tasty. Yeah. So I think everything eats them. And uh, by the time rabbit season, there's not quite as many left. So, and, uh, oh, speaking of wildlife, uh, today was one of the days I used the tea to get to work. So, like, I was walking along, you know, down to the station, and a turkey was on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, you know, kind of, like, paused my uh, music player and popped out an earbud, you know, just uh-huh. in case. But, you know, it just kind of hopped up over the guard rail. Guard rail. Yeah. yeah. I saw a turkey this morning. I, I, I was, well, I was up in the morning. I was, uh, I looked out the window, and I see a deer in our backyard so i walked downstairs we were looking at the deer and i walked over looked at the other other side backyard and there's a turkey standing out there <laughs> so lots of lots of things this morning so um we actually did get some podcast feedback um so in the like three days or so or maybe three days maybe four or five ish days that the uh, podcast video has been up uh buck face uh the uh, Ian Buck uh, of the Nexus uh, kind of responded to uh, the video, or at least posted comments. So uh, I'm just going to read them here, just because. I started screaming when I saw that SSD. Holy crap. Well, yeah, being single and having a well-paying day job is amazing. Uh, then, whoa, what's going on here? Something flashed. And Firefox is not responding. It's Firefox. Anyways. Oh my. Okay, just it, as I just as I was ready to go on to the next comment. Did, did Firefox ever come out with that uh, multi-threaded tab thing, or is that still in beta? Um, apparently not, because my whole thing went down. Uh, stand by for reopening document. I, I keep waiting for that feature. Like, that's been my most anticipated Firefox feature for a while now. Um, for me, that while is like 10 years. 10 years, <laughs> yes. Uh, anyways, going on. Your deadpan delivery of it is larger in both capacity and physical size than the SSD is amazing. Well, it's true. And I showed the screenshots to prove it. Uh, I don't get the money gag. Is it supposed to be like you were paid by Intel to bash on AMD? Or that the CPU you wanted wasn't released yet, so that was the cash you needed to buy it? Uh, it was actually the former. I didn't really want any other CPU. A C conversation over the heatsink after the gag. Uh, since every PC hardware reviewer of note that I've come across has mentioned that they have been accused of taking money from or being biased towards a company while simultaneously being accused from other people of the same thing for competing companies, I wanted to play a joke on that. Also, I wanted to criticize a bit. I got these things because I wanted to, not because these things or companies are perfect. Uh, Buck uh, adds, I'm surprised that you you are putting the RAM and CPU on the motherboard before putting the motherboard in the case. Well, that's how I've always done it. I've never really considered fishing around uh, for screws to be that big a deal. But then again, I've usually had shorter heat sinks than this one. Uh, Buck says, Ha! We don't edit the show. Honestly, the reason why video is so much harder than audio is because it requires way more manual editing to be good. Well, I learned that the hardware, hard way during the week or so that this was late in getting up. I also had to learn video editing. And in a re-response, uh, Buckface says, It's a challenge for me to find the time to cut together even a two to three minute video each week for Teen Almanac. And I've streamlined the process quite nicely. Uh, I guess he does something for uh, like his teaching job, I think. Um, Ian says, You started the build without a screwdriver on hand. Well, it's an adventure. Everything was going so well up until then. I mean, the case the case was toolless, at yes. least like most parts of it. Uh, Ian says, The PS2 
port has lasted a long time, much like how the PS2 was the longest of supported console. hey -oh! Well, I guess that since everything else has is a shorter supported console, that's the reason why everyone, uh, being consultants and market analysts and manufacturers, are uh, saying that console generations are getting shorter. Uh, Ian says, interesting, I thought that it was a drive that goes into a PCI slot. It has its own dedicated spot on the motherboard? Well, think of it as a P special PCIe X4 slot that can support other buses, like USB and SATA. An adapter is as close as you can get to having M.2 go into a conventional PCIe slot. Uh, uh, Buckface also notices that Steven doesn't read Schlock Mercenary. And I said that I swore that I got it elsewhere through some osmosis of pop culture. It's not a maxim, though. Uh, to which uh, Buckface says, uh, It may not be a maxim, but I was definitely exposed to the saying through that comic. The light is being held still, if the building's structural integrity is willing. And, well, if it isn't, you have bigger problems than lighting. <laughs> uh, so, if you would like to uh, give us any feedback, go ahead and do so on the Nexus.tv, uh, spe uh, specifically on the show notes page. Um, I will try to look at the YouTube comments, but that's not guaranteed. Uh, so, don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your stuff because some ransomware might be coming after it. And also make sure that it is offline, like completely unplugged and like maybe in a safe box. <laughs> uh, so, uh, anything else you'd like to add? Oh, not too much going on. I'm building my, my gun that I've been building for the past seven years too, so I <laughs> made a trigger for it the other day. Nice. So it actually might get finished up for deer season this year. So, um, yeah, meanwhile, I've been biking around Pittsburgh. This past weekend was was uh, great. Uh, I was a little bit worried there about Saturday that it might not be warm enough, but it ended up being just warm enough. So it was probably about perfect because it kind of was had a chill to it, but if you're on the bike moving, that wouldn't really matter if you're kind of really expending a lot of energy and but getting then, warmed up. But then you have the wind chill. Yes. So. So it kind of like balances Evens out. out. Yeah. So you know that's that's why I put a fan in the basement over the winter while I was uh, on the uh, stationary bike rack. To thing. condition yourself to having the wind in your face when you're when you're riding. Yeah. So you know apparently the wind rushing the not not necessarily the wind just the air going past you while you're on a bike really helps cool you down. Because if you're just in one spot, then you kind of it kind of builds yeah, up. Yeah, there are a lot of heat. Yes. So, uh, I might actually go out tomorrow evening, uh, if it's good, and uh, then on Wednesday is uh, our friend Chris's birthday. Oh, Wednesday. Yeah, which for some reason I thought his birthday was last month, but apparently it's this month. So we, we should, probably should find some good Elsa card or something good idea uh i work i work next to a cvs so i'll go in there and see what i can there do there you go <laughs> um uh so yeah he uh let's see uh i'm going over to his place instead of him coming over here um uh, zach is going to be there as well and uh as a side note if you were wondering who the guy was on the couch of the last episode that was zach uh, he's like another one of our friends from church. Uh, so, uh, he's going to come over and, uh, the, uh, the last time he came over, uh, he wanted to bring over, uh, uh, was it an installation of retro pie, you know, like the, uh, emulator on raspberry Pi that emulates all the old gaming systems. Uh, but apparently he was a little disappointed because his dad took that into the office with him <laughs> and... I guess lost it or something and I'm like wait your dad works for Comcast right he's like yeah he pretty much sits around and waits waits for things to break 
So I guess he's like a tech or something. Must have done a good job of uh, fixing things so they don't break. Which is unusual for Comcast in some ways. Yeah, I know. They kind of have a <laughs> reputation there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll be doing that and writing around some more. And hopefully you will be hearing this show before too long. Um, so, yeah, have a good one. You too. <laughs>